solutions to uh, understanding chromatin architecture in all in all life domains, as we learned from yesterday lecture. She is also recognized with many pre, um, prestigious honors and awards for her research. Now, Dr. Luger is a distinguished professor at the University of Colorado Boulder and a HHMI investigator. Finally, we would like to thank to thank the support for the Steamboat Lecture from our department, Wolf and the Summer Fisher. Now let's welcome Dr. Luger for an exciting lecture. Thank you. I feel like deja vu all over again. I feel like I've done this before. Uh, I don't know quite know how that happened. Thank you for the kind introduction. Thanks again for hosting me. Thank you everybody who's here for maybe a second time, which is very hard to imagine. Um, so, so I'm not gonna give my talk backwards like I advertised yesterday, but I, I, I will talk a little bit about more general aspects of my career with the hope that maybe some of you who are earlier in your career stage might find instructive. So can I just ask like how many, how many undergraduate students are here? One, two, a couple, how many grad students? Many, good, okay, this is for you. <laughs> and then all the rest of you, you just have to suffer with me. So, <laughs> and, and we'll see how this goes. I don't know lengthwise how we're doing, but we'll be done in 50 minutes, I promise. I'll just cut it short. So when, when I was like your age, um, uh, around thereabouts, um, that was my idea of a typical career path. Um, I thought professors were born like that, and then they they were, of course, white and male, and they knew everything, and, and that's what happened. And uh, it took me a while to figure out that that's not a typical career path, and in fact, mine really uh, worked out like this. It was a random path, maybe with some attractants and repellents. So I was doing random walk. Uh, I had attractants. I knew I was curious about nature. I loved planting things and growing seeds and, and, and tomatoes and stuff like that. I wanted to know how cells work. I really liked solving puzzles. And I had two older brothers and they were very techy and they always talked over my head. And so I wanted to show them up and, and show them that I could also do science. Um, repellents were, I did not like uh, sick people. So MD was not an option for me. <laughs> I did not like teaching teenagers, so high school teacher was not an option. That really didn't leave a lot of leeway. I didn't really want to be a pharmacist like my aunt, and so I really didn't know what to do, so I took myself off to the nearest university, uh, which was three hours away by train, uh, to the University of Innsbruck. Not a great university. Um, entered the major of microbiology, and I was lucky enough to be adopted by the biochemistry department and biochemistry sounded like you know that might get at how cells work and things like that so kind of a random walk into that department uh, did research there I found it exhausting because I was working with Bernd who was a very senior research fellow there and is almost like running um, running trying to run an ultra marathon with a trained ultra marathon runner, never having run even a 5K. So, you know, this guy kept going. I was exhausted. That was my induction into biochemistry. Nothing worked, but I did learn to pour a really mean sequencing gel, gradients. <laughs> I, 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 I brought them home to my mom, the films. Uh, she was very impressed. I, I learned how to do mini preps uh, from scratch. So that was good. Um, I then did a brief internship in industry, um, which I really hated, but I met my future husband there, so that was good, I guess. <laughs> and then I took myself off to PhD work in Basel, where my then future husband also resided. So again, kind of directed random walk. Um, my PhD in Cosper's lab was amazing because he was a very hands-off mentor and a very creative mentor, and he would let us do whatever we wanted to do. And so I did a really crazy project that amazingly worked um, and we could publish it very well. And so that really got me hooked into science and I wanted uh, to do more. At that time, um, we were working closely with the crystallographers. They were all a bunch of really um, 
unkempt and unwashed uh, guys who spent many hours in the dark room uh, and in the diffractometer to solve the crystal structures. And I was just really intrigued by how you get from these patterns to a structure. So that's what I wanted to learn. And so I decided to interview with Tim Richmond, who was then uh, a new professor at the ETH Zurich. He was a superstar establishing crystallography there. And also uh, postdocs at the ETH uh, paid really well. So that was also an attractant, shall we say. And, but before I did that, I decided um, to, in, in the words of my PhD mentor, make a really valid attempt at not having a career because I took a year off with my then husband uh, and we, we rented, we bought an RV and we drove it all across every single national park in the United States. And our uh, pièce de résistance was to canoe uh, about 2000 miles down the Yukon River in, in, in this very trustworthy little rubber dinghy, which was really amazing. Uh, and it was a good thing that I took a long vacation because what I did not know at that time um, is that I was really in for a real, <laughs> a really hard project. And we were trying to figure out how the human genome is packaged in the nucleus. So that, that sounds easy, right? After canoeing down the Yukon River, it seemed like that was manageable. Um, and just to give you all um, a little bit of a size comparison, if the nucleus were the size of a golf ball, it would contain about 10 miles of DNA, a really, a really, really thin thread. And you'd have to package that in a way that you could replicate it faithfully. And you could also find the pertinent information in a spatial and temporal accurate way. So um, I give you a little bit of a history on, uh, on, on the structure biology and what people did before I entered the field, which was nowhere near its infancy. So back in 1974, uh, Roger Kornberg um, had deduced from a lot of careful biochemistry that chromatin is structured based on a repeating unit of eight histones and 200 base pairs of DNA, which we now know is still true. Um, uh, Francis Crick and, and Aaron Klug then deduced that in order to package and compact the DNA in this manner, it needed to be kinked rather than curved because the curvature would inflict too much of an energetic penalty, which turned out to be wrong, but that's okay. <laughs> in uh, 1976, which is um, way, way, way before most of you were born, um, Finch and Gluck developed this solenoidal model of the, uh, of the chromatin structure, again, based on theoretical uh, uh, considerations as well as whatever experimental data were available, which wasn't really very much. And this is still one valid model of uh, chromatin higher order structure. So this was 1976. In 1977, um, Finch and Daniela Rhodes and Michael Levitt and Aaron Klug uh, got these really pretty amazing electron micrographs of chromatin nucleosomal stacks isolated from, I think, calf thymus at that time. This is uh, the electron density map projected. And based on that, as well as some careful DNAs, one digestion of chromatin, they came up with this model of the nucleosome. And if you superimpose what is now known as the nucleosome structure onto this model, you see a pretty amazing correspondence. And so my point is that yes, there were really important and really good papers written uh, before you were born. And, uh, <laughs> and, and we actually already had a lot of information before um, I or even Tim Richmond entered the field. So this was 1979. In the early 80s, uh, Tim Richmond then uh, managed to get crystals that diffracted to about seven angstrom resolution. This is the structure. Um, it's really not something that we would throw on the cover of nature nowadays. And, but we, we could clearly distinguish the DNA from the protein. So it was known that the DNA was on the outside. That was actually known before then. And it scattered a little differently. But clearly, we had no idea how the histones were arranged at the inside. And the, the assignment of the histones on the inside turned out to be 
completely wrong. But a lot of this uh, model was actually um, facilitated and supported by very careful uh, cross-linking experiments by Mirza Bekov and colleagues. Um, and that turned out to be, those, those uh, cross-linking data turned out to be um, completely consistent with the structure that we know today. So again, my point is that, yes, they did very careful, very quantitative biochemistry and structural biology in the old days. And hybrid approaches, even at that time, were a thing and really helped to deduce uh, structures that by current knowledge now seem to be correct. So now enter the early 90s and me <laughs> when the dinosaurs worked, walked the earth. This was the dark ages. All the cool kids were working on transcription. This was Teach and Tashni and all these guys working on TF2D and T, the whole alphabet soup. Nobody cared about chromatin. In fact, chromatin was thought to be completely unimportant. Uh, the histone post-translational modifications were actually known, but they were largely ignored. So I have a textbook from 1984 where all the modifications are described in full detail, but nobody knew about their biological importance. Cryo-EM was niche for proteins, blobology, wasn't really apl applicable to this. Third generation synchrotrons were just being built, so X-ray crystallography was really the only game in town, and we needed very hard X-rays to solve uh, structures from, uh, for very large complexes. Computer storage and graphic systems were about the iPhone zero level, and if that, we actually had whole data sets. We couldn't even process whole crystallography data sets because they were like megabases in size. And so we had hard drives and tapes. We had to shuffle them back and forth. So I'm that old. Yes, it's true. Um, chromatin was isolated from chicken blood and calf thymus, so natural sources. And um, there was also a structure of the histone octomer that was published in 1991. So this would have been amazing because this would have provided a lot of really good information for phasing. But uh, this group refu refused to deposit their structure on the PDB, uh, which at that time was not required, so we could not really use it for anything. And then current nucleosome crystals still diffracted to only five angstroms, and we still had not solved the phase problem, which is a problem that's inherent to crystallography because you can't refocus X-rays. So unlike in cryo where you can just look at things, you have, to, um, you have to solve the face problem. That's all I will say about this because it brings back really bad memories. <laughs> okay, so the path towards higher resolution. When I started, it was clear that we needed um, histones that were homogeneous and not heterogeneous because we knew at that time that there were a lot of post-translational modifications. Nobody cared what they did, but we knew they existed. We knew there would be a problem. DNA sequence and length of the nucleosomes, when you prepare them from these little arrays isolated from calf thymus, were not uniform. And so it was clear that we needed to build nucleosomes with defined DNA sequences and with recombinant histone proteins. So we needed to make recombinant nucleosomes. Okay, so that was my task. And that was four years of my life in the bucket. Um, and what we did is uh, we, we duplicated a DNA sequence that we felt would really like to form nucleosomes in a plasmid. We then did 12 liter plasmid preps to isolate enough of that DNA fragment to, um, to um, make nucleosomes for crystallography. So milligram amounts of this 147 base pair DNA fragment, a lot of phenol, a lot of ethanol precipitation. I'm still not sure what it did to my brain cells and <laughs> I'm sure I don't wanna know. Um, histone expression, we needed to express each histone in E. coli. Uh, this was not a trivial task at that time uh, because you couldn't really order genes online. So it was a different time. That's all I will say about it. We then isolated them. We had to re I had to refold them to form a histone octomer. Um, and then we had to devise means to combine DNA and protein to form mononucleosomes. And while we're at it, we also made nucleosomal arrays for higher order chromatin structures. So we could do it on duplicates of, of the positioning sequence. So um, having done that, this was all great. Um, uh, I did a lot of uh, quality control 
to ensure what I've made was really the real deal because it didn't have any enzymatic activity. And so how would I know that I was really making something that was not garbage? So we did that, that was all good. Then we set up crystal trays and that was before robots. So there's a lot of greasing and pipetting. Um, and this is what we got. Super pretty to look at, really bad crystals. They're actually worse than the crystals we got from chicken blood or calf thymus. Uh, they were thin window pane crystals. If I could mount them, they would diffract about five angstroms on a good day. And they were really slow and unpredictable in their crystallization behavior. So sometimes they wouldn't crystallize for a month. Sometimes they would crystallize in a week. It was just a nightmare. So this was about year four-ish, I think. Great for morale, of course, <laughs> because you see your career chances slowly circling the drain. <laughs> Um, and, but but um, I then had uh, an idea that I think, uh, or I did an experiment that I still think was the most important experiment of my career. I, what we do as crystallographers when we get crystals, it's always a good idea to take them, wash them, dissolve them, and analyze them. So that's what I did. So this here is the input. This is a dissolved crystal, okay? And what you will see is that the input looked fuzzy and they just always looked fuzzy. So this band is very fuzzy, right? Kind of bloated. The crystal is really not fuzzy, nice crisp band. So that was weird. So then I decided to take the mother liquor. What is the mother liquor? The mother liquor is the solution that in which the crystal resides. And that's where the leftover protein would be. There was no leftover protein. There was no leftover nucleosome. And Everything is gone and incorporated into the crystal is not fuzzy. So by very sharp deduction, I concluded that the fuzzy material is transformed into non-fuzzy. Okay, very scientific explanation. Um, and so what we then discovered um, subsequently, uh, shortly after is that indeed, um, the nucleosomes that we make were not uniformly positioned. There was heterogeneity in the positioning. There was DNA sticking out this way or this way, or it was centrally positioned. And it turned out that the crystal only liked the centrally positioned species. And so uh, in equilibrium, it just pulled everything out of the solution. And that explained all of my fuzzy versus non-fuzzy and empty mother liquor data. So that's great. What do you do with this? Now, then again, a stroke of genius, um, very high tech experiment. I stuck my nucleosome Eppendorf tube into a heating block, 37 degrees, half an hour, boom, we're non fuzzy. So this is great. You can then crystallize this material and you obtain resolution that goes from here, which is really not great to here, which is good. So this extends all the way to about two point angstrom and beyond. And, um, if you push it really hard, it goes to 1.9 angstroms. I just want to show this because it is very, very pretty. Okay. So check, right? Sample homogeneity, diffracting crystals, awesome. We still have the phase problem. And in order to solve the phase problem, and I will really spare you the gory details, I had to um, engineer about 20 cysteine substitutions throughout the histones to then hook up heavy metals to then perform multiple isomorphous replacement. Nowadays, we do these structures with selenocysteine or selenomethionine. Wasn't really an option here because the structure was too large and also there was no system to incorporate selenomethionine. Um, and so this had to be done. A lot of these things did not diffract. A lot of these things did make, um, gave me very bad crystals. Some of these things gave very bad phases, but finally we managed to pull this off. If you're curious about uh, of a more um, scientific explanation of what I told you in brief, you can look at this free iBio video uh, that is um, that that I took with uh, with this with this uh, nonprofit organization. There's actually a lot of really good videos uh, out there by various scientists explaining their key experiments. So I really recommend all of the undergrads and grad students to look at this site. Okay, so uh, September 19, 1997, 
very happy person. This is, uh, this is me at that time. I already was a big hiker at that time. Um, uh, and so we managed to publish this structure. Also huge shout out to people who are not on the paper, Song 10, Thomas Recksteiner, Yvonne and Andrew, my partners in crime. So this was a huge team effort. I also encourage you to, um, to take the code of this. This is Hitoshi Kuromizaka and I forced him to write, he's a very talented composer and musician. I forced him to write a nucleosome birthday song and that's what he did. And that was before chat GPT, so that's really his thing. <laughs> so this is a rock song about the nucleosome. Okay, good. Um, so mission accomplished, we have a structure of the nucleosome. Um, it, it's not only beautiful, but it also, I think explains really well um, a lot of the biology and you can, you can appreciate how tightly the DNA is wound and bound by the histones and how much of a problem that's going to be for transcription and repair machinery and all the good stuff. Nucleosome also entered pop culture. Um, it, I'm sure it, it inspired the Millennium Falcon. This is from Star Wars. Um, I, I, I'm sure, right? That must, be, that must have been it. And also, um, I, I just want to show this because it just gives me so much joy. Um, this, there's this cancer scientist, uh, Dr. Brian Welm at the University of Utah, and he is also an artist and a welder. And he welded a giant nucleosome for me, about this big, and he gave it to me as a present. I didn't even know the man, so this is totally fabulous. And, and I, it's in my living room and it gives me joy every day. So, all right, so back to, back to careers. <laughs> So eight years, one paper, what's next? I should also say that in those eight years, um, and I don't mean to say this in a mean way, but I received no mentoring whatsoever on the next step. I was there to solve the structure of the nucleosome and I did that and the rest was my problem. So that was just the way it was at that time. Um, but I did actually around 95 or so, Tom Check visited our department. And he's very famous. And, and the last slide he showed was the view from his office. So I decided that's where I needed to be. <laughs> and so I, I moved over, uh, not to Boulder because they didn't want to interview me, but to the uh, University of uh, Colorado State University, which was a, is still a not well-known university, but a land-grant university with a very strong mission in undergraduate teaching. Uh, also a strong vision. They wanted to get crystallography going in their department. So I thought, well, I'm, I want to do this the hard way. So why go to a department where they already have this set up if I can do it from scratch, right? It makes perfect sense. So I started in 2000, pretty soon um, uh, recruited these four rather forlorn looking graduate students sitting on the side of the road. Uh, the lab grew pretty rapidly. Um, 2005 um, till uh, 2010, we had a pretty good size already and a lot of fun. A lot of good things happened in 2004. I, I got HHMI support and I also had a baby. And uh, at any rate, we grew the lab in, in many ways. <laughs> we had a lot of babies, as you can see here. So, um, so these were really productive times, shall we say, in the lab. Um, so at, at CSU, my, my first mission was to build an X-ray diffraction facility. And um, that was good. It, it, was, it, it was interesting, uh, dealing with contractors and such. So, And I'll, I was also learning how to teach. I was learning how to mentor. I was learning how to run a lab. I made a lot of rookie mistakes. I kind of muddled through it with the help from my friends and asking a lot of questions. Uh, scientifically, we were addressing how epigenetic variations affect chromatin structure, so post-translational modifications, histone variants, and all that good stuff. And we were uh, really interested in how nucleosomes are assembled by histone chaperones. And finally, um, we started a project that, that is also still ongoing and uh, how, how the cancer drug target PARP1 senses DNA damage and how it can be inhibited and how it interacts with chromatin. So these were our project. Uh, our project in 2015, I felt I needed a little bit of a change of scenery, but not too much. So I moved down to CU Boulder, 
who didn't interview me way back when, but now they, <laughs> now they did hire me, which was great. And um, I pretty soon um, started hustling and bake sailing and campaigning for a Titan Krios microscope, which did not exist at that time. And so this is, this is the arrival of Princess Krios uh, on campus in October, 2019, about the same time I think your guys' first Krios arrived. Um, this is Shanna, my administrative assistant, who was instrumental in getting her set up and wrestling the contractors and all the good stuff. And we had first light in 2020. And just to, to convey to you how excited we are, why we are so excited about this is this is kind of the, the wasteland in which Princess Creo sits. There's, it's the only game in town still. And we're very, very proud of her. She performs really well um, and we treat her very well. We now have a Glacios and, and I just don't get over these 2D class images. This is not even a particularly good one, but now we can just, the fact that we can just take a nucleus and put it under a microscope and look at it, it's just amazing to me. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about science. Uh, so this really allowed us to then study projects that weren't really accessible to X-ray crystallography before. And that is that nucleosomes are interaction hubs for nuclear factors. So there is about 30 million nucleosomes in the nucleus, a lot. Uh, they're very densely packed and they interact with many factors. Uh, that's, that's part of their job. And, um, but the best, the, the most frequent interactor of nucleosomes are themselves because they pack to form higher order structure. And so there's primary, you can almost equate it with um, uh, protein structures as primary uh, amino acid sequence. In this case, it would be the different flavors of nucleosomes with different PTMs and histone variants. These can fold in into secondary structures and that then determines tertiary structure. This is a very simplified way of putting things, of course, but um, that's what we were interested in. And a really good case point, a really interesting uh, case study would be the centromer, the human centromer. Uh, in humans, so the centromer is a specific region on a chromosome to which the mitotic spindle attaches, okay? It, in humans, it's epigenetically and only epigenetically defined by the histone variant SAMP-A. Doesn't really have a special DNA sequence. The only thing that tells a centromer to be a centromer is SAMP-A. So we have a nucleosome in which H3 is replaced by an H3-like protein, okay? And it's this protein that then recognizes a whole alphabet soup of the inner kinetochore. So a whole slew of proteins converge on this poor SAMP-A nucleosome uh, to then nucleate the outer kinetochore, which is again another slew of proteins. And among those proteins, there's three different ones that specifically recognize SAMP-A from H3. Now, what do they recognize? There is really not a lot to go by. This is the H3 nucleosome structure, and this is Hitoshi Kuromizaka SAMP-A nucleosome structure, he of the nucleosome song. There's really not that much different. They look like nucleosomes. The only difference to write home about is this little dinky loop that sticks out in SAMP-A. So we were really interested, how does how does a protein recognize this really minor difference and then nucleate the entire uh, kinetochore on this? And this is a really fundamental question because if you get this wrong, you really screw up your cell division and then you're dead. So you have to get this right. All right, so um, those were the questions. And enter um, Cody Zhao who said, I will do this by cryo-EM. This is when we just started. We didn't have a Krios yet. So Cody said like, I will do this with cryo -EM. And we were super lucky because CG was uh, at that time in Tom Check's labs and he was, he was going, he was a little ahead of us with his other project. So Cody and CG teamed up and, and, and I don't actually know what you guys did, but you made it work. So, <laughs> so huge shout out, shout out to CG. This is kind of how our department in Boulder rolls. We really help each other. Um, and what goes around comes around. So thank you for that. And Cody got this to work amazingly. Um, and this is a structure at 2.6 angstroms. Uh, and remember, I spent like eight years of my life to get a 2.8 angstrom structure of a nucleosome. And now literally undergrads do this um, on a weekend, on a good day. 
Okay, good. So, so this is our protein kind of stuck, our SEMP N protein stuck to SEMP A nucleosomes. And I don't want to go in the detail. This is way too much detail here, but I just want to say that we now know how SEMP N specifically recognizes this little rinky dink loop that sticks out of SEMP A, and that is not present H3. So that's how it discriminates. We've also recognized, we've also learned that this protein has a very large protein DNA interaction phase, interface, as you can see here, it's almost like it sits with its butt back on the DNA. And that interaction is, of course, it can do it with any nucleosome. Okay, so that was interesting. And we published this um, together with Andrea Musacchio, who helped us with a crystal structure of SEMP-A that they had in a lot of other biology. So, what Cody noticed, even in the first days when we weren't really that interested in higher order structure, he noticed it formed these nucleosomes. When he added SEMP-N, it formed these pesky nucleosome stacks. And he tried to avoid them and pick other particles. But then he went back to it and he started to pick dinucleosomes because he figured he could then determine the structure of those um, dinucleosomes. And indeed he did. And it turns out that SEMP-N bridges SEMP A nucleosomes together. So it forms these nucleosome stacks, almost like a little bit like a sticky glue or like these. This is one of our collaborators who loves these mac macarons. He, we wanted to do a cover for our paper. And so the poor man had to go out and buy macarons to take these pictures. So, you know, I was really feeling sorry for him. Um, okay, so uh, this is a structure of these nucleosomes glued together by SEMP-N, so very, very cool, and a way to promote chromatin higher order structure. And they do this by uh, employing an additional DNA binding interface that we actually didn't even know existed. So on the other side of SEMP-N that was just like hanging out in the breeze, that also is a very basically charged surface that then is used to interact with a neighboring nucleosome. So this is all good, but in real life, nucleosomes do not exist in isolation. They actually exist in nucleosomal arrays. And so remember, I told you right at the beginning, this approach could also be used to make nucleosomal arrays. And so we made 12 more nucleosomes where we just have a very long piece of DNA, and then you position 12 nucleosomes on top of that. And you can add SEMP N, and you will notice that you find uh, you get very regular, um, very regular stacks uh, or compacted zigzag uh, arrays of nucleosomes that are promoted by SEMP N. You do not get this when you have no SEMP N present. And Cody managed to solve the structure of this um, of this array as well to much lower resolution. To be honest, he didn't try that hard to push the resolution because we didn't really need a lot of more additional information. And also he was out on um, job searches and ready to jump to the next adventure. But what we learned from this is that, um, that SEMP-N promotes the folding of SEMP-A arrays in this manner. And these arrays look very different from other arrays that are possibly um, spawned by uh, the presence of the linker histone H1. So what we think, and there, there's a lot more biology here, and uh, we actually teamed up with Aaron Strait at, at Stanford, who is a centromer uh, specialist, uh, to test in vivo whether the second DNA interface was responsible for forming higher order structure, and we found that indeed it is. And so this second interface really seems to have biological importance. So we believe that SEMP-N is a centromeric kind of a linker histone. It's like double sticky tape that helps congregate um, uh, centromeric nucleosomes with normal nucleosomes uh, because that second DNA binding interface does not rely on the presence of SEMP-A. The only decoding function of uh, SEMP-N is that little rinky dink loop. There's one interaction interface. It needs one of those, and then it can hook up with a normal nucleosome or any other nucleosome it wishes to do so. Okay, so we think this promotes um, long range and short range nucleosome interactions and is responsible to form a really specific uh, structure uh, at the centromer. Um, so 
Uh, so much for that. The, the point I wanted to make with the story is first of all, a huge shout out to CG for, for helping us. Second, uh, this was our first cryo -YAM structure, so we are immensely proud of it. Um, and, and third, the types of things that you can do with cryo -YAM, uh, would literally not be possible with X-ray crystallography and vice versa. Some of the small things that I showed you yesterday would not have been possible with cryo -EM. So we need them both and we love them both and uh, we'll continue to use everything, even NMR if we have to. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I, I actually grew up scientifically next to Kurt Wüttrich um, and, and so I'm a little, shall we say, uh, opinionated. Uh, with respect to NMR. That's all I'll say about this. <laughs> okay, so I have a couple more minutes and uh, I just wanna talk about uh, one other big project that uh, really was, we, we'd been chewing on for a long time and then really was made possible by CryoEM. And that is what happens uh, to, to paraphrase Roger Kornberg when an irresistible force, the RNA polymerase meets an immovable object, the nucleosome, something's gotta give, right? And what gives is that we have to kick out the histones, and but we also have to maintain chromatin in the wake of the polymerase. So we need histone chaperoning to prevent those histones from aggregating on the DNA or on the RNA. So we need histone chaperones. We need these to stabilize these partial nucleosomes so that they don't completely discombobulate and we need to reassemble in the wake. And um, there's two very diverse classes of protein factors that are responsible for this. One is histone chaperones. They are literally like the chaperone at the high school dance. Uh, they prevent hanky-panky between inappropriate partners. Um, they're also a little bit matchmakers because then they help reassembly, which I hope the chaperones at the high school dance do not do. <laughs> and then we have ATP-dependent chromatin remodelers, uh, and these guys are big SUVs of machines. They use obscene amounts of ATP to shovel nucleosomes out of the way and to remodel uh, chromatin in general. So I'll tell you uh, one story for sure, and maybe we'll get to this one because this one is done by John Markert, who is a U Wisconsin alum as well. I have a great pipeline, it seems. Okay, so, uh, and, and the work on fact was done by Yang Liu, who's now also at the, who's now at the University of Hong Kong. So what do we know about FACT? FACT was originally designed, by, uh, designed, discovered by Danny Reinberg and also Chris Formosa. Um, it is named very unfortunately because when you search FACT in PubMed, you get a lot of hits, obviously. <laughs> and, and, but it's named for facilitates chromatin transcription, presumably by nucleosome disassembly. So that's how, biochemically how it was identified. However, a knockout in yeast leads to nucleosome assembly deficiency. So that kind of begs the question, what does it do? We now know that is hugely involved in transcription, replication, DNA repair, and we've renamed it much to Danny Reinberg's chagrin to facilitate all chromatin transactions. We've maintained the acronym though, so just to keep him happy. Uh, it turns out that cancer cells are addicted to FACT. In, in, in most cancer cells, FACT is hugely upregulated up to one FACT molecule per nucleosome. Uh, and so it's being explored as a cancer drug target. And we were really interested in how does FACT work in these different contexts and what does it do to nucleosomes? Without ATP hydrolysis, uh, what's its job? So, um, our first forays into this was not very exciting because it turns out that fact actually does not even want to bind to nucleosomes. So what kind of a factor is that, right? That's really not very useful. Um, and so when you take fact, add nucleosomes or DNA, no binding. But we figured out that if you pre-incubate fact with histone H2A, H2B, it somehow gets activated you can then combine it with a partial nucleosome and it will make a complex that then might be amenable to cryo -EM. And this is what you see here. So this is a gel shift. And when you do this experiment, you see some leftover histone at the bottom, but you also see um, complex one and complex two. There's two bands for crystallography. This would be the kiss of death. Like it's a no-go. 
for cryo, eh, what the heck, you just slap it on a grid and see what you can see. In this case, we slapped it on a grid, it looked horrible, and we needed a lot of, and CT also helped us with this, we needed a lot of help uh, from Bridget Carriger. We used Spotted On, which is now Chameleon, different freezing techniques. So it was really not an easy project. But Young and Cody together managed to solve the structure. And um, we, in fact, is a heterodimer um, consisting of two multi-domain subunits. Uh, we, despite the fact that we put the entire fact complex into our uh, complex, we could only see the colored bits. So there's a large part that is disordered, but what we could see was already hugely informative. The resolution is also not amazing, but uh, a good starting point. And what we can see is that fact looks, it kind of looks like a, like a unicycle and it sits astride the nucleosomal diet and each subunit dangles around on either side. And there's also this um, long C-terminal domain that seems to hug the histone dimer. So um, just to summarize the findings from this and, and, and the information that we gleaned from this is not so much like where every atom is, but really in its mechanism and its regulation. Um, so, so I guess my point is that yeah, we would have liked higher resolution, but you should not discard a low-ish resolution structure because it can still be very, very informative. So FACT has an extensive DNA binding interface despite the fact that it does not bind DNA on its own. So that was interesting. And second, uh, the C-terminal acidic domain mimics, it acts like it's DNA and tethers the H2H2B dimer to the body of the nucleosome. We actually didn't give it enough DNA, so usually this dimer would have flown off, but we tether, we tether it with a C-terminal acidic domain. So this, this allowed us to develop a um, model for its regulation. So we thought that this C-terminal acidic domain is the one that auto-inhibits binding. When we delete it, we actually can get this thing to bind to DNA, okay? So this is shown to the gel uh, and the gel on the left. It's not great binding, but it is capable of forming a complex with DNA when you delete the tail. So we think what happens is that in the absence of histones, when fact is just trundling around and minding its own business, we think this domain is kind of swinging to the inside and binds to this acidic, to this basic DNA binding cavity, and it auto inhibits itself. Then along comes a free H2H2B dimer because it got kicked off, off by a polymerase or something. In fact, fishes it out, um, hugs it to itself, and then can dock it onto a tetrasome. And this explains the nucleosome assembly function that we observe in vitro as well as in vivo. Alternatively, and this is also incidentally how we made this complex for cryoEM before knowing anything about this mechanism. Alternatively, FACT can also encounter a nucleosome with partially unwrapped DNA, and that we know is an intermediate during transcription. The DNA has to be peeled off. This thing is kind of left over. FACT recognizes it, it hugs it, it grabs the dimer, it hugs it to itself, and this is the complex whose structure we actually solved. And it prevents the dimer from flying off, and this really explains the tethering and stabilization function of FACT. Good. So I just uh, hope you appreciate how much like DNA this, this CTD looks like. So it's a true DNA mimic. Uh, the deletion of the C-terminal domain in yeast is lethal. And so that really lends credence to the model that we've developed here. So um, I just want to summarize this, that fact is a nucleosome maintenance factor. It's neither an assembly nor a disassembly factor. It's kind of just a repair crew that cruises around and looks for histones and bad nucleosomes and just kind of tells them, it's okay, don't worry, we'll make you whole again. And so that's kind of how I see its role. Um, and uh, the regulatory mechanism um, is, is such that it only engages partial nucleosomes, which is actually a good thing, especially when you have a lot of fact. And so FACT will be engaging nucleosomes that have lost parts of their DNA. It will also capture free histones as they're flying around and reassemble them in the wake of the polymerase. And that model is, and the structure is really 
highly consistent with all the biochemical data that was in the field at that stage and was later beautifully illustrated by, by some amazing structures by Hitoshi Kurumizaka and Patrick Kramer's lab, uh, where they actually had fact and nucleosome and polymerase uh, in a mega complex and they could show it in all in all stages of its life cycle. And it's doing exactly what I have actually depicted it's doing here. It's doing all of those things. So, all cool. Um, explains its central role in all DNA processing uh, pathways because every polymerase, whether it's DNA or RNA polymerase needs to peel the DNA off. And so we encounter these intermediates. Um, what we do not understand, I'm really intrigued in hearing opinions, is this dependence of cancer cells. And we don't know what the cause or effect is. It could be that in cancer cells, you have um, so much disordered, dysregulated transcription that you have a lot of destroyed nucleosomes and you need a lot of fact to kind of rein them in. It could also be that fact is overexpressed in cancer cells and too much of a good thing is not good. And so fact just starts to destroy nucleosomes and that results in destroyed nucleosomes. And that then in turn results in, in transcription that is dysregulated. So we do not know what this connection is. So I think um, I will probably stop here. Um, I just wanna give a huge shout out to, to John, who's been a fabulous uh, graduate student in my lab, who independently worked on, on a complex that's called SmartCAD1. Um, and I, I'll show you what, what, it, what SmartCAD1 does. It is um, involved in transcription, replication, DNA damage repair. It's a chromatin remodeling factor. And John figured out what its structure and its mechanism is. And it's really been a tour de force work um, in, in the lab. We're still working on regulation. So this is an ongoing project. And with that, I will, hang on, um, I will finish and acknowledge the people who did the work. So Cody and Young, um, who are now in, at the University of Hong Kong, faculty members, John Marker, who's a postdoc at Harvard, but probably will be on the market soon. If he applies to this place, you should hire him, he's amazing. And then uh, I, again, uh, 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 a huge shout out to Pamela Dyer, my lab manager of 22 years. So she started with me uh, the year after I started or two years after I started, been with me ever since and truly indispensable to the success um, of, of my lab. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions about anything or let you go off and do your thing, whichever you prefer. Thank you very much. question about the nap what or i'm sorry the fact mm -hmm. um chaperone structure and the extreme c terminus the acidic and i think you and, and possibly rebecca hill and others have found that other histone chaperones have these polyacidic stretches mm -hmm. like naplan that are polyglutamylated and i'm just wondering if you have any evidence from your structures of of this modification and do you think it might play a role in its chaperoning function yeah, that's a blast from the past. So, uh, so polyglutamylation has been discovered on on tubulin mostly, but also on histone chaperone, especially um, on fact, and also on a chaperone called NAP1. We did a lot of work on the polyglutamylation in NAP1. Uh, we never published that because there was a key experiment that was missing. And then the student graduated and nobody wanted to pick up the project. What we did find is that polyglutamylation of these, of these tails regulates their activity. So yeah, I actually had forgotten about that. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> so another question about the fact um, C terminal domain um, seemed like the knocking that out is obviously lethal in yeast as you described, but is it more the acidic nature or the length of the C terminal domain that was found that's like really crucial? And if so, like which residues, I guess I'd be curious to know were found to be really important regarding that. Um, so uh, 
it's mostly D's and E's with some interspersed other residues. Uh, our density was not good enough that we could have the register. We just know it dangles down from there. So we could not build an atomic model of that tail. Um, I believe that, um, that Tim from Mosa, they chopped off the entire C terminal domain. I don't think they did piecemeal uh, deletions. So I can't answer that question. If I had to guess, I would say that if you make it much shorter than what we see here, uh, it's probably not gonna do, it's probably going to have the lethal, lethal effect. Any more questions? Great talk. Is there something that removes fact from the nucleosome um, or does it just kind of hang out there if it st stabilizes the nucleosome? So during transcription, um, Hitoshi Kurumizaka like pictured, there were like eight cryo -EM structures, the whole life cycle. So the polymerase eventually shoves it off. And we've actually also shown that when you shove it off the DNA, it sits on the histones. And so it hops over from the DNA to the histone, it binds the histones, and then it goes off. Hmm. It, it's kicked off completely. So during transcription, the polymerase motor kicks it off. When it's just cruising around doing its healing thing, if it indeed does that, we don't really know. We probably, uh, once it's assembled the nucleosome, I believe what happens is that the DNA competes off uh, the CTD, and that kind of makes it lose its foothold and it's uh, dissociating. Uh -huh. And we have in vitro evidence for that, but it's not super strong. Do, do Archie have a version of fact? No, they don't. No, it's a eukaryotic gig. Yeah. They don't really need it. The polymerase doesn't really, isn't really that slowed down by nucleosomes in Archaea. Um, any more questions? Okay, like thanks, Dr. Luger, again for the awesome Thank talk. Thank you.